Just rip it. <laughs> Let's just rip it, baby. Hello, guys, and welcome back to another Editing Guests episode. Today, I am so excited. We are joined by none other than Patrick Sterling. And I think we have a bunch of fun stuff to talk about today. Welcome, Patrick, to the show. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very excited. Today, we're going to do a little bit of a different episode. If anyone can't tell, we're just going to kind of have this be a real casual conversation, not maybe as crazy as some of the other Jake episodes, because I wanted to catch this kind of lightning in a bottle moment, which is you and I have both had about a week with DaVinci Resolve 19, um, I, I'm hoping you played with it more than me. I think we're going to have lots of good stuff to talk about, but I want to kind of get you and I's thoughts this at this point in. But before we go into that, I think in case people don't know who you are, I want to get a little bit of your background, um, understand you know your background with editing, where you're at today to kind of give people that context before we just get real nerdy on DaVinci. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh like Jake said, I'm Patrick Sterling. Um, right now, I mostly do uh, my, my big thing. I have a YouTube channel. I talk exclusively about DaVinci Resolve um, and the little niche in there being the Fusion page and some real exciting stuff going on in there. And then I'm in uh, plugin and preset and template development. So I make those and then, then that, that's also part of my day job as well. Um, but I've been in the broader video world for a while um, you know, my high school had an elective video program that I got in. They were on Final Cut 7. Nice. And yeah, I, 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 they were on Final Cut 7, got in that. They had the whole suite, so you know, they had their, their Color Pro and then they had Motion, very early Motion. And so I started dabbling in Motion and then like got online and everyone was like, you gotta use After Effects. Yeah. <laughs> so I convinced I convinced my film teacher to pick up the Creative Cloud suite, which I think was CS3, uh, CS3 at the time. And then like from then on through like my college career and into some work, I pretty much pursued After Effects more towards the motion graphics side along with standard like video and some like light film stuff. Um, and that's what it was all about. I, I really got into some of like the more I was always more like technically minded in After Effects and like creative stuff uh, or like design stuff. So much more into the motion versus design part of motion design. Um, and I think that has carried through to some of what I do now. Um, but yeah, started, followed along. I went to, I got a pretty broad media degree in college and then entering the workforce, I hopped around a bit, but always in like pretty, you know, smaller marketing teams or like video teams at a university, that sort of stuff. Um, just like, yeah, making videos, finding little ways to make those videos cooler using After Effects, that sort of stuff. No, and that is, okay, I didn't actually know that you have a little, so I guess Final Cut 7 was, so you used that before 10. Did you ever use 10 then? Probably not. Not until very recently. Oh, really? Okay. And even then, the recent stuff I've done has not been like production. It's been part of uh, like looking at presets and like that sort of stuff. Um, but no, I mean, I was in high school. It was either my junior or senior year. Must have been my senior year when X dropped. Okay. So like remembering, have a very clear moment of that, like culturally is super interesting. That's something I really like. Cause everyone was like, what, what are we doing? Like what is, and you know, I, I think it's not out there to say like it took them a bit to find their feet mm -hmm. but also oh, like sure. even not being a final cut 10 user like i'm like a pretty big fan for not being a user like i think it's great i meaning i think the the pros are pretty awesome pros versus the cons dude that's so interesting to hear well and two you you said you had after effects stuff so i i'm just super excited to kind of hear a little bit about that um at some point in today's chat because like again you are you know i mean i don't want to make anyone else feel bad or or i don't know i'm stumbling on my words here but like you're one of the resolve guys in my opinion you know like you are one of the <laughs> the leading horsemen of the of the resolve you know army and i just think that it's cool that you actually do have that background which was something i wanted to ask about because um you know the fusion stuff that you do you've come from after effects that's really interesting to me some of the stuff I'm sure I'm going to want to talk about today is very much in relation to my past with Final Cut. And I mean, a lot of my channel is 
really from that angle, which is like resolves amazing. Final cuts amazing. I just haven't tapped into the premier landscape because it's expensive, but like I, you know, I, tr I try to kind of toe that line. So I, th I think we should definitely hit on that at some point. Well, yeah. So like I was completely in premier world through school through so so i was aware when resolve started you know making little moves and stuff the first time i used resolve extensively was summer of 2016 mm -hmm. and that was resolve 12 12.5 12 and that was still too early like i was running a small media team at a summer camp and i made everyone use resolve and that was <laughs> like I, I didn't need to it, like it worked but like it still had some work to go um and i think I think people might have different opinions, but like uh, Resolve 15 was a big deal. And then really I think Resolve 17 was finally getting that point of like big boy contender. Yeah, 17 for me, I feel like was kind of the X for Final Cut equivalent where it's like, whoa, this is real now. Like there's some features here that are really juicy and they're, they're trying. Well, gosh, and that is... <laughs> just a perfect segue because i'm like like if 17 is kind of that big release that we remember like how are you feeling about 19 like like general sentiment compared to like 17 how do you feel about 19's release overall i feel good about 19 to me especially with the history of updates it feels like the kind of update that i'm more mature piece of software has i totally agree with you <laughs> like i mean as much as some stuff like the replay system is close to a foundational shakeup for what resolve can do like that's absurd but <laughs> like i think they're always gonna try to tack on some crazy mind-blowing stuff but like across the board um I, I made a note a little while ago i think a really interesting thing about 19 is that it actually follows up and expands on things first introduced in 18.5. Yeah. Like text-based editing first came in 18.5, uh, USD tools in Fusion, and 18.5 was the introduction of the first of those more advanced AI audio tools, like the background and a dialogue leveler. And now even the new audio tools live in that same panel, in, the, in that same area of the UI. Um, and I, that struck me as pretty interesting because like that might be the kind of new area of features you might uh, like expect to see on a big like point O release and then fleshed out. But they, I mean, Blackmagic is always the company that's kind of just like, ah, if we can do it, like we'll like do it and do it now. <laughs> so For sure. yeah. So yeah. And there is plenty of like completely new stuff in this, but I thought it was pretty cool that like a lot of the more exciting stuff is just them going further on on stuff that they've recently just yeah. thrown in. Yeah, and I think that was a lot of my initial reaction was like overall maybe not the spiciest of updates that we've gotten. But I mean again, like I've got I still have a I'm still dipping my toes constantly in final cut land and I mean like an update like this would shatter us in, in the final cut world and so it's it's kind of one of those things where i'm like trying to kind of be a little bit more level-headed in my approach of this of like yeah this kind of feels like a smaller update but <laughs> it's still awesome stuff and, and again we're going to get into it like there's there's some really cool features here and just like you said like the transcription stuff feels like it got a lot of a lot more juice i'm not sure i Actually, I'm curious how you feel about that. I don't know that functionally the juice has amounted to much different yet other than just kind of some small quality of life. Like when I think about using the transcription feature, like being able to place on top, that should have been there from the beginning. Good. I'm glad we got that. And then being able to identify speakers, unless you've thought of another use case, to me that's cool, but it doesn't help me cut necessarily i don't know unless i haven't like played around with it enough like i feel like that feature is gonna turn into maybe autopod or something i hope <laughs> yeah i'd be all for that but i think that is primarily like a review feature more than an active feature like if you've got a transcript those small notes 
might help you, you know, scanning a larger document of versus just text. Like if you got like an interview set up and just one person asking questions, you can jump to their questions much more easily than looking for question marks or that sort of thing. Yes, no, and that's true for interview. Dude, for interview or anything documentary, that feature, like, like I've been like wanting to edit a doc since that feature came out. <laughs> there's there's so much stuff with black magic across the board. Cool stuff black magic does makes me want to do so many different kinds of productions or like I haven't done live stuff in forever, but I want to get into live stuff to use some of their cool live tools. Yeah. Even yeah, which... like event work is some of the roughest work, but like the things you can do now and soon in the future with Blackmagic Camera coming to Android, which I'm crazy excited about. You could just have, you know, you're working a student event, get a handful of students with their cameras all linked up to cloud. They're all just shooting all over the place. Those clips are instantly going to your editor, cut something live. And then when a session is done, you got like their highlights from earlier, go into social stuff. Like it just feels, feels like, like there's, I like when features make you think of opportunities to use them in a cool way. And again, there's a lot of stuff that just like, I don't know that would ever apply to me, but that one, yeah, is totally in that category of like, man, if you were back, yeah, like in college or something, working an event or doing whatever, I mean, it's like, this just opens the world. Like suddenly it becomes like you could film everything and everyone would be into it because everyone's filming on their phones anyway. Like it's, it's genius. <laughs> well, I'm curious it could have happened this year. I don't know if it actually did, but like something like NAB, absolutely perfect use case scenario. You can have whoever you want on the show floor, but if you've got one person sitting at a workstation and the person's filming on their phone, instantly to that person, do whatever little tweaks you needed, you can get that extra polish over people just uploading from their phone. You can get that quality. I mean, yeah, they could be on their phone or they could be on any of the new cameras that have camera to cloud built in you would get that quality instantly. Like perfect use case for it. Yeah, it's it's like you said, it's one of those things that I'm just like, how do I how do I get on a project like that? Like how do I try to find someone who's doing something like that? Cause it'd be so fun to be like, hey, I've got the solution for you. Here's how we're gonna do it. And just like see their brain explode if they're not in the editing space or whatever. One one of my favorite things to talk about with Resolve in general is how, in my opinion, again, not super, uh, we'll see how, we'll see how I can say this. <laughs> <laughs> Resolve is so interesting because I think it actively courts and is actively really good for such wide disparate ends of the spectrum of the video world. It's free. You can do a crazy amount of stuff for free. You can be scrappy on your phone and get access to crazy high tools, especially with some of this cloud stuff. You can see the benefits for crazy high production and it can handle that quality. A lot of the color world exists at that high level. And like some of the, this is a good segue back to update stuff. Uh, but the main color tools, the color slice and the film look generator, uh, color slice, maybe a little less so, but they are, they seem to me to be very beginner or not crazy high skill ceiling friendly, which is a incredible thing to exist on the color page. I mean, everyone again is kind of trying to get, and that's what they're trying to tailor to, right? Is like the more filmic cinematic look, but like, I mean, DaVinci Resolve's color grading page is monumentally I mean, it is a laser cannon of a tool, which is great. If you know what you're doing, you can do anything. But so the fact that they're kind of baking in this like, hey, if you're just kind of trying to get here quick, maybe it's not, you know, you're not going to blow anyone's mind, but you're getting 80% of the way there with little to no skill. That's awesome. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I I don't know how they've managed to tow that line so well. It's very impressive where they're like, we cater to just someone who's trying to like make content for the internet or whatever all the way up to like you chilling in Hollywood land. And to me, that's just, it blows my mind because I don't think, I mean, again, I don't know how, if you, 
if you've kept dabbling in Premiere or not, but like I don't think Premiere has really succeeded at covering the spectrum as good as Resolve has, and I personally think Final Cut has never succeeded at that. Every time I hear someone that's like, I did a movie or I cut the movie in Final Cut, it's like, okay, you were just cutting. And how'd you collaborate? Like what what was, you know, just like so many questions fire into my head. I mean, uh, Adobe benefits from its 10, 15 years of just being what everyone uses. Um, I, I think their cloud stuff has gotten better since I last used it. But the only experience I have trying to use cloud stuff was awful. And like the way Blackmagic Cloud Projects works is the a way that makes so much sense to me. And even like new editor on a new computer, load up a project and the media just sinks. It's like, oh, that's, that's real nice. Like that's real nice. Pick a place you want it to go and you're off to the races and it just starts working in the background. Yeah, it's... Whew, it's it's awesome. Kind of taking us on another path. Well, not really another path, but still in the same vein. So with 19, again, we're kind of, I think our kind of our general sentiment is, you know, maybe not super spicy, but lots of cool stuff here. Again, definitely not trying to undermine it, but in the in the in the things that we've seen in the past, maybe a lot of quality of life updates. That being said, I've got some stuff <clears throat> that I feel like is amazing. So hit me with some of the things that came out in this update that are really exciting to you. Um, and I'm sure we'll overlap, but if not, I'll, I'll give some of mine as well. <laughs> Maybe the biggest deal that's like adjacent to me, but I know I don't use is like a lot of proper color tools for fusion. So like fusion in like color managed projects can be a mess. Cause like the color page exists after the fusion page, but like a lot of what you do on the color page has to interact in weird ways. I know that's a big deal. Um, a number of like, okay, um, I am a big fan of the shape system inside the fusion page. They added a text plus tool that can live inside that system, which is a really big deal for the kind of stuff I do. And for those who don't know the shape system and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it is the vector based system in fusion, right? So the fact that it didn't have text was actually kind of crazy. And again, trying to kind of get people up to speed like the sh vectors are mathematical implementations that allow for stuff to be resized without pixelation right so beforehand you didn't have a way to do that with text <laughs> well before that the text tool itself was you could infinitely scale text but as soon as you go out of that tool you start connecting the text to other stuff going on in your frame if you m tell the text plus tool to make really small text and later you tell it to scale up, you're gonna lose quality. But now anywhere in the shape system before you get to an S render node, you can add another transform, scale it back up as large as you want, all that, all that's good. Keep going with your features. I actually have a lot of questions around fusion and vector stuff for you, but I wanna make sure to, to get your favorite features first. Some cool small stuff I really dig. Have you, have you used the EQ since the update dropped? It's so nice. That was one of my big ones where I was just like... You see it and it's like, oh, that's cool. And then you use it and you're like, this is like shockingly helpful. Have you... I'm trying to think here because like, so obviously I use Logic a lot. Any EQ had an analyzer like that. Um, Final Cut, any... Like not the built-in EQ, which is really rudimentary, but the pro of EQ effect that you could add also had the preview analyzer thing. So like, had you not used another tool with that before? Cause it was one of those things in Resolve that I was just like, well, I'm so glad it's here, but where the hell has it been? <laughs> yeah, I can't remember now. Cause maybe it's not as common as I think it is. <laughs> I don't know. I like, like for instance, I don't know if on the standard like Premiere one it's there. No, it's so nice, dude. It's so nice. And then, especially for the kind of stuff I do. So they added a thing called referenced fusion compositions. And fusion, fusion is wild in a number of ways. But one of the major ways it's wild is that there are so many different ways to like begin to interact with the fusion system. And so many different like subsystems to where like, you can bring a clip into the fusion page or you can drop an effect on a clip, which like tells fusion to function a little bit differently or you could turn a number of clips into a fusion clip, which again functions differently, but lets you access those original clips. 
but lets you access those original clips based on how they appear in the timeline. And now we have reference fusion clips to where reference fusion clips let you share one fusion build between any number of clips or like combination of clips. The one exam the one I think entry level really good example, I, I recently did a video about it, is that if you've got like a picture in picture effect, you're down in the corner and for whatever reason you decide and the way I, I have done that for a long time is I have just like a fusion effect. I made drag and drop, my picture goes in the corner, it has a drop shadow, all the, all the stuff you want. But if I had a dozen clips with that effect on it, if I wanted to change all of those to be in a different corner, I would need to go one by one or like rebuild an effect and apply it to all of them. Now I can take all those clips, sync to a reference composition, and any change I make to that reference composition propagates through all of that. Which that is so nice because yeah, I <clears throat> everything you're saying I've had happen where it's like, oh, I wanna tweak this. And then you kind of start doing the mental gymnastics of like, <laughs> if I've gotta do this more than 10 times, is it gonna happen? You know, do I do I really want to tweak it that bad? So yeah, that is it. Oh, I didn't know about that feature. That's awesome. That's a great one. The wild thing is that like, yeah, that is the bare bones, like makes sense, super useful. But if you select like two clips on top of each other, you select them both, make that a reference composition, your reference composition can access two separate inputs for each of those clips at their source resolution. Oh, cool. So I, the, what I'm gonna use this for, I'm gonna rebuild, I have a preset for like, tic, for like TikTok editing, mostly for like streamers and stuff. Like you have a screen recording, your camera's down here, you wanna pull different stuff in from the game system. I'm gonna rebuild that in this new system because a shortcoming of some of the other methods was they can sometimes mess with like resolution in interesting ways. So now if someone has a 4K, stream recording clip, but they just want to make a 1080 TikTok, we can keep that full 4K resolution even as we slide stuff around, scale it up, and you can do that with any number. I also think it's going to be the easiest way to functionally save effects for people because these fusion clips live in the media pool. You can save them in power bins. So again, I live in the preset world. It's not crazy complicated to save your own preset of anything you do in fusion as like a proper drag and drop preset but it's not as easy as just building it once and just saving that composition to a power bit. No, that's incredible. And again, this is this is why I love talking to you because I would say like I've gotten a lot more into fusion, but definitely like this stuff is not my skill set, right? And I'm selfishly I'm wanting to ask some questions about it cuz you're 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 the guy. Um so it's so great to <clears throat> to hear your opinion on that stuff because it's so powerful. <laughs> Small backtrack I want to do when talk like again, I have a background in After Effects. After Effects, my first love. Like I haven't touched After Effects in a while, still love After Effects. Okay. Sure, the systems are very different, but the most important stuff flows between them between them flawlessly. Principles of animation and handling a proper like easing curve more than like tossing easy ease on. I think a fair amount of people who like do some cool stuff in After Effects, if they just toss easy ease on all their curves, then they're gonna have a harder time going to fusion than someone who like really dives into the motion graph, really fine tunes a lot of stuff and like understands some principles. Cause like the tools can change the principles don't. Um, at a previous at a previous job I had, they paid my way through an online course from School of Motion, which is one of like the larger online like motion design, motion graphics training thing. All their stuff is in After Effects, and you know they expanded into like C4D and some other stuff. But I took an animation boot camp entirely in After Effects. So valuable, even once I moved to Resolve and Fusion. And I think that's what's crazy is I feel like the animation sphere for those who aren't in it feels like a black box, but exactly like you're saying, I mean, really all it is is elements, keyframes, and then deciding how you want the transition between those keyframes to be, right? Whether, you know, and that's the whole curve, easy ease type stuff you're talking about. I guess that does lead exactly, that's perfectly into my question that I had, because I recently watched a video and I'm so sorry to this individual, I forgot who made it, but they were talking about, um, it was a great video talking about how they're actually a little nervous for Resolve's future regarding Fusion 
and the vector workflow and how After Effects, even though, again, like if they can get the performance and all of that, it might have been Ryan. Yeah, you probably watched it. He was, I, and again, I'm I'm kind of talking on a, a subject I don't know, which is why I'm asking you because I've got you here today. But the Adobe Illustrator, probably Ryan Osborne, probably that sounds right. Um, the Adobe Illustrator world, being able to make your own vectors and then import it in, right? So like, yeah, what what were your thoughts there? Because you're the biggest advocate of like, if it's in After Effects, you can do it in Fusion. And I was like, I need to know what Patrick feels about this. In general, I think. The actual value of something like dynamic, like the way people talk about it is a little, I don't know if overhyped, but just like as a feature, like it's nice, but nothing touches dynamic link between Illustrator and After Effects, even though you can bring the files in After Effects, like Illustrator to After Effects is such a phenomenal workflow that people have been using for a really long time. And for a lot of people, like doing regular, you know, like that stylized vector kind of work in After Effects, I don't think there's anything that can replace After Effects for that. With that S stuff, the shape stuff, the vector stuff in Fusion, there's no way to kind of make, like, can you make your own custom? Because that was the whole argument I think he was making is like, if you have like a little character or animation or whatever you've got all the layers you've made all the shapes which again are represented as these vectors it's so easy to bring it into after effects from illustrator and then i was just kind of posing the question of like i just haven't played with the vector stuff in fusion enough there really isn't a way to make these or it's just way more tedious the the shape system is most powerful if you begin your process and you do the entire process inside fusion Like, you could design just about any vector thing natively in Fusion. I believe it has most of those tools you would need, maybe outside of some, like, assist tools, like maybe some, like, uh, not stereoscopic, but isometric 3D stuff exists in, like, some, again, it's not super my design world. Um, But I think a legitimate big weakness is that there is a system in Fusion now to import vector art as an SVG, that's the file type. But when it does that, it imports those SVGs as the more old school fusion path data, which is for like masking. And you can like mask shapes and use it that way to where for for some designs, like if your SVG is for like poster work and your animation is like slide different things in from the side, like that can handle it. But it doesn't import the the vector files into its native vector system. And I think that's kind of just like, the import existed long before the vector system did. So like, I would love for them to bring those together. Um, I'm sure for some people who would love to do more of that work, that's like a more in-demand feature. Um, but like, that, that makes sense to me. But again, that's not, I, I've imported SVGs like two times. <laughs> no, and that's totally fair. And I, I think I'm coming from like from my context is like I do a lot of really silly animation stuff with, you know, PNGs and all of this. And kind of like we talked about earlier, there's some limitations there of just like how much can I move and zoom this around before I'm running into some moments of quality loss. And I'm even like a huge fan of Again, I love Fusion. I'm trying to learn it, but like just being in the edit page with Magic Animate from Mr. Alex Tech, you know, not sponsored, (laughs) like just throwing that in there and moving stuff around and doing things like that, like that just feels like home to me. But there is some desire in my head to, again, kind of level up, learn about some of this animation stuff. Could I make a Jake dorky face type thing? in the vector sphere and have it be way more flexible and do more cool animation type stuff and i don't know i'm just wondering if maybe i mean i just need to learn it is the answer but maybe i'm also heading into a space that's not a great tool for it and i'm all about the right tool for the right job (laughs) again me not being the most like design minded person i i my first stop is like okay even like standard graphics you're bringing in really diving into the spline tool in the fusion page at a base layer because even some of the incredible options it has for like repeating animation or looping animation 
or like set relative, like you just set two keyframes and it will go on at that same speed forever, um, is pretty slick. Um, so I think like that, that'll help you like express more in your animation. The big weakness as I see it right now in like vector work exists more in the realm of like character animation. Which that probably I wouldn't be as interested in, but I don't know, maybe. Again, it's something to probably play around with, but. No, very cool. Dude, this, this is why I've had you on here. This is, this is the stuff that again, the, the, the nerd, the nerdy Jake fam is all about. So I love it. I love it. I also wanted to mention, so let's see, you, you talked about um, the reference fusion thing. You talked about the EQ. I think you mentioned one more. The one that I didn't hear you mention that obviously we got to talk about is the remix music feature. That's, I feel like that's probably my biggest juicy one that came out this go around again it's just because there's so many music companies that don't do stems that now suddenly are like really interesting to me like i again this episode is not sponsored by anyone i have loved epidemic and like track club because they provide stems for ages but between you and me like something like music bed the quality is mm, chef's kiss like that is pro music right and it's like ooh. Music bed's looking real good after this update. <laughs> it hits such a crazy sweet spot because sometimes there's a new feature that's so much fun. But like, then you're like, when am I going to use this? But music or mixer is like, this is really fun just to click buttons. And like, yeah, I could use it like here and here. You could use it in fun, creative ways to even when, even when you have stems, like, sure, do you want to mess with like, intermixing between those stems all the time? Or do you just want to rig up automation on one effect to be like, hey, in this section, I don't want drums. And then you can bring them back over here. Totally. Yeah. No, it's, that's the thing is it, it just makes that whole audio sphere so interesting to me. And I, I, I also have, you know, I've got a keyboard over here. Like I've got a huge music background. And so I have so much fun doing music and being locked in to a track and like trying to work around vocals or whatever like i've always hated i've never been about that <laughs> i've like seen a fair bit of your music stuff which i love my music background is in more engineering and like front of the house mixing nice so like i did i did that for a bit through college and, and different spurts afterward but just like basic signal chain stuff hits that like technical bit of it like ooh, like yeah just give me like basic compressor, basic EQ. Let me rig up some buses on slightly more complex stuff and like I'm, I'm feeling good to go. So like, yeah, I, Fairlight hits all the extra, the, the little extra stuff I want really well. I have always sung the praise of Fairlight and DaVinci for audio mixing, processing, producing, whatever. And again, it's cause, you know, I used to spend so much time in GarageBand and Logic and that kind of stuff, which I'm so rusty on. We're getting back into it. But, like, it is, I mean, it is a DAW <laughs> in a video editor. It's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. I think Fairlight is, is probably, in general, severely underrated. But even, like, among the scope of, like, it adds so much value for just being, like, not flashy. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just like, yeah, just audio page. But, like... That's another thing. I've never seriously done any like ADR stuff, but like the ADR tools, it has like, that's a whole other side of the software that like, it's just like built for doing cool stuff. I, the one thing I've wanted for a while, even though I probably wouldn't buy it. And if I did buy it, I wouldn't use it, but I just want a micro Fairlight panel. Mm. 2020, 2021, yeah. they released their desktop panel, which is incredible and sexy. Like, ooh, it does. It's like everything I would want if I was in that world, but it's also like $3,000. And I think for the people in that world, that's probably killer, but like, I'm not gonna buy a $3,000 audio panel. I remember thinking the exact same thing. I was like, oh damn, I'm never gonna buy this thing, but whoo, does that look good? A micro panel, just give me like four tracks with modrized little faders, just like strip it down. I'm even kind of shocked 
I, I have interesting thoughts about the speed editor, but I'm kind of, Ooh. um, but I'm kind of surprised that they haven't just released like a standalone jog wheel. Dude. Oh my God. That thing would sell like hotcakes. I would have bought that over the speed editor. <laughs> yeah. Meaning I, I think maybe, maybe with the, some stuff, uh, you need the shuttle controls. You need some of the different stuff, but a little while ago they released like their jog wheel for like their like replays, not replay, um, but for some of their more broadcast type stuff. And like, just let this connect to resolve and do a little jog wheel and we're in there. Oh, for sure. Well, and that's the thing is like, I, I, I have liked that product. I've tried to find all kinds of different ways to use it. I've found a couple that I like. Um, and one of those is literally like, I just have it like sideways next to my mouse so I can be in the edit page and just jog, right? Like, which is the dumbest use case of it because I'm throwing away literally all of the keys. But I, okay, I would love to get into this with you. This is something I like. This is a hill that Jake sits on, gets on my soapbox and dies on all the time. I hate navigating my playhead in the edit page. And this is totally because I come from Final Cut where the secondary playhead is with my mouse and I just, I've done hot, I'm, 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 in fact, I'm literally working on a video this week to try to like kind of give my pitch on the closest thing I've found to secondary playhead, which is A, they just released fixed playhead on the edit page. So now you can scroll with the mouse wheel, which is great. It's a little laggy. I don't know if I realized that was part of that. It's awesome. So on the edit page, you hit command or I guess I'm on Mac. So command, which would normally scroll. I didn't think about how that would interact with other systems. Yes. So you could be playing and then you can just be like, oh, let me go back really quick and just and you don't have to take your hand off the mouse. Great feature. It's a little laggy. I don't know why, because when you don't use fixed playhead, it feels like it's really quick to like if I click somewhere, it just starts playing this one. It kind of stutters sometimes. Not sure what's going on there. Um, and then having dedicated hotkeys in my left hand for moving the playhead is something I've been trying to. And even both of those still are not as good, in my opinion, as a secondary playhead. So have you used Final Cut with the secondary playhead? And what am I missing here? Why will DaVinci not add this feature and make it toggleable? <laughs> Who knows why things happen? Um, like, but, is there a, is there a technical limitation you can think of? Cause that's what I keep trying to go to is like, if I, if it, I don't, I don't think it's a technical limitation. I think it's a, how on earth do you prioritize and know what a unfortunately meaningful group of your user base actually wants? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's much more of that. And I think, I mean, you go on the, the black magic forums and there's, so many things that like you read them and it's like, sure, that would be useful. But I also think like how many sub menus and check boxes do we want to pack into the edit page for like interacting between clips in certain ways? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, again, since most of my time in Final Cut is like around like using and changing and modifying presets, like sometimes like I'm still not crazy in love with that secondary playhead because like I'm so used to like having a clip like in focus or in the inspector in resolve and like browsing other clips, but like not selecting them unless you have selection followers playhead on versus like if I just move over a different clip or like move my play, I'm also, while we're on Final Cut grievances, my only other grievance is that I still, off the top of my head, have no idea how libraries, events, the other th three things, I don't know what any of that means. So every time I need a new something, I create a new all of them. Dude, it's just a complicated Apple rename of like stuff that is silly, yeah. Oh, new project, you mean new timeline? <laughs> yeah, I think that would be useful. I. I, I must have gotten into it pretty quick, but like it is so in my muscle memory. Uh, maybe it's because I'm also, are you are you a mouse or a trackpad user? I'm a mouse user. Dude, hit, don't be shy. Hit me with why I'm wrong. This is why we're here. Like I'm. <laughs> it is not a thing. It is not a problem at all. To Anytime I move in my timeline to get there, 
I click in that timeline bar above that and live skim. And I just like hold it down when I know what I want to select. I like let go. It's like, I, I think a, I think a keyboard shortcut to sort of get into that mode. So like you live skim without having to first click there would be rad. But also it is so in my muscle memory. Like that's just how I navigate a timeline in general. Cause I always click in that bar then slide. And that's why I ask, right? Because again, I'm just like, this is something I am so used to that I always keep coming back to with frustrations. And it's like, I think it is just deep rooted muscle memory and bias, right? It's like, this is what I'm used to. <laughs> yeah. And again, like, and then as you're skimming in that way, all your keyboard shortcuts are live. So you can trim, you can do stuff. Like you can review footage very quickly. Like you can skim through stuff. You have your audio playback. Um, I do, that gets to something really interesting because I maybe to the point of loathe <laughs> conversations about what is and is not intuitive in video editing software. Yes. Because <laughs> I don't think it means anything. I think to an absurd degree, what anyone thinks is intuitive is how did it work the first time I learned it in the first piece of software I learned it in. And that becomes intuitive when it's just like, no, just it's different. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think... And I love towing that line on my channel of trying to kind of like weed through that of like, what, what is the tool here? Like, what is the tool good at? And what is it getting you versus, you know, what are you just used to? And that's why I tell everyone all the time. It's like, hey, it's taken years, but I do feel like I am as fast in resolve for the most part as I am in Final Cut. It was different. I had, to, you know, change a lot of synapse paths in the old gray matter upstairs but you know there's a reason people love premiere like it's good it's a great tool there's a reason people love resolve it's good it's a great tool it's just different and it's really up to you and i think this is kind of what you're saying it's up to you to decide what are the tools it provides and is it worth it for me to learn those tools because of what they allow me to do versus just like are they easier or more intuitive and that that is a part of like why some of what I said of just like I like like slash respect like Final Cut as a platform and like the Final Cut community I'm all about like there's some rad peeps in the Final Cut community and so a lot of that is me taking it on their word of like once you get up to it there's a lot of stuff to love and like you get to a cool spot. I, maybe it's my slightly more technical minded stuff, like a standard timeline where stuff lives on tracks. And if you move it, you know where you're moving it to. And if you overwrite something, it's like, yeah, cause you're, you, cause it's there. And like now something else is there. That makes sense to me, uh, but I'm not so close minded to see that like, sure, other stuff is probably nice, but like, I like the, I like, it feels kind of, a little more physical in a way I like. Premiere, especially when I started moving over, still feels physical, but like once you're in Resolve for a little while, Premiere starts to feel like industrial in, a, in an interesting way. I, it shows it's, maybe it's, it's showing it age, but it just like feels like, oh, like I'm walking into a, a warehouse of stuff. And some of that is like design and small stuff. Like I moved, I really solidly moved over, like maybe, I don't know, 2021. And just like Resolve looks better. Oh, it totally does. I, I think, yeah. I mean, for everything that it can do, the design language, like I still feel like it is an anomaly of a piece of software. Like it's one of those things that like, sure, I'm always wanting more. I'm wanting things to be better. But at the end of the day, like, in the world we live in, the fact that this exists is magical, in my opinion. Grant Petty, man, he he does the stuff. He's way too, yeah, he's just, I'm trying not to glaze him up too hard, but it's hard not to, because he just get he just gets it, dude. It's hard not to love Grant. There is something about a CEO that just gets in the weeds, is not a, you know, he's just doing it. He is just doing it. <laughs> Grant also talked in the update about like the cut page and how they kind of had to leave, let the cut page live for a bit. But like the cut page towards some of this replay features, super cool. Um, even, even like, 
when the Blackmagic camera was announced. A lot of people did not like that, but like that is a pretty shockingly valuable and meaningful part of a larger vision. And one, I'm sure it was super useful off the bat just like getting files through the cloud system, seeing how that worked before it rolls out on like all of their cameras. But also, I, I think we see that extra commitment. One, I mean, the updates on the app have been pretty awesome. And two, them bringing it to Android. Like, it's, it's almost like they're not joking around when they talk about like giving creative tools to people of like, yeah, you get a bunch of people on the phones they already have and you can do live or quick turnaround production that is impossible. <laughs> well, and actually it's so funny you said that because like, I was just thinking about it. Like imagine even like we talked about like the school thing or something more produced, but imagine even someone like you or me who in the family knows how to do this stuff and they get to like a family, like say it's like the family week at the cabin or something. And it's like, hey, download this app, this week, you need to just film videos with this app. It's gonna all go to the cloud and I will edit it together. But like, dude, think about like, oh, we just came up with a use case. I might have to do that this summer where it's like, okay, everyone, you gotta use this app and I'll make the dopest family video. You don't need to touch a file at all. There we go. We found, we, 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 got, to, we got to Jake's use case. I'm gonna make the best vacation memory video from my like big family get together. How ham could a wedding go? Dude, yes. You would, oh my God, dude. Holy, that, someone, someone out there right now. Of just like walking down the aisle, you're cutting between 50 different viewpoints. Dude, you, someone is gonna, is gonna go do that. Someone is gonna go be the next like wedding king with that idea. Yeah, even without like live or quick turnaround, even for a final video production, being like, hey, if you want to film the wedding, cool. But especially, like, call out a moment or two. Call out them walking up or down the aisle and say, like, film it in this app. The, the, I mean, the current thing is uh, you need a Blackmagic Cloud account to get invited to a specific project. But in this last version, they also updated their remote viewer app to where you can connect via IP. So, all they need is some sort of guest system. Have a guest login, not to interact with the project at all, just to drop media. Dude, but here's the thing, okay? This is, this is great, and it would be fun to do interactive, but even if, because here's where my head is going, like, even if, say, like, you or me, like, we're running the wedding business, we've got, like, we've invested in like six iPhones with like our name and sticker on them. And we're like, just attached to like, Hey, this camera just gets given out to certain people. We've talked, you know, we've talked to the bride and groom they're in on this. Like there's going to be six or 10 or whatever iPhones that are just like someone has them and they're filming and then it just goes up. And again, it's like, if they're bought in on that idea, it's just going to be the funnest wedding video because you've got 10 people that have, you know, your, one of your cameras, which is so wild, it's just a phone. And they're just running around capturing the whole thing. And then you get back and you're like, okay, I've got all the footage. Let's start editing this, the coolest, most, you know, intimate version of this possible that isn't like the only version that would be more chill than this is if there was just no filming whatsoever. <laughs> but to film with your phone, everyone, everyone's cool with that these days. Someone's gonna be a gazillionaire and they have you and I to thank, you're welcome. Cause I'm, I'm not getting into the wedding game, but someone will with that idea. That's killer. Man, before, before I sort of properly diverted into YouTube, I almost felt guilty about like, again, the few weddings I've worked, I, I just can't handle that like metaphysical level of stress. It's like, why are you trusting me to do this wedding? <laughs> but like, you feel so bad leaving wedding money on the table of like, I could, I could do this, but I didn't want to. I've done a couple. I did my cousins as a gift because obviously I'm the the camera guy of the family um, and had a great time doing it. But yeah, it is, it's so stressful. You have to cut this. No, you don't have to cut this, but you want to be a part of something cool? Sure. So I think I've wanted to do it for a while and I think I'm gonna f hopefully finally get around to do it when the Android app drops. Because I want to do a video that's like, depending on 
time-wise. Like, I want to do it like editing a global vlog in an hour or something. And I want to get a handful of people who live as far apart as I can get them. Uh, I've already talked to Alex, he's in, so we'll, we'll at least get international. And just be like, hey, we're gonna set up a time at the same time to like go get ice cream. And we're just gonna click like, hey, I'm eating this ice cream. Give it a one out of five rating. Thanks for watching. And then cut to me at cut to me doing the same, walking to my computer, seeing all of those video files show up live, edit them together, and we're done a global vlog in like half an hour. Dude, I'm I'm in. That's a killer idea. I love that idea. Yeah, you tell me when. <laughs> close, to, close to like I don't know if I've made a good YouTube video, <laughs> but that is close to a singular idea that like ooh that's. That's pretty cool. It definitely hits the realm of the more sensational side, which, well, sensational is maybe the wrong word, but it's just a, it's a very story driven idea. And I love that. Yeah, I might. Well, and the, the a stealth update, I think they just announced it. Oh no, I saw someone, I saw someone do it. So they pushed out an update to their cloud store and cloud pod projects to where now those can sync to black magic cloud. If you have that locked in, that can instantly start pulling footage as soon as it's uploaded without you uh, without you even having the project open. Because right now, the way it works is you have to open the project. Which is not my favorite. If yeah. your cloud pod is connected, it's constantly grabbing footage added to all of your projects. And when you open it, it's there. Dude, that's genius. Yeah, and I need to buy one potentially for that reason alone. Unless they just add it some other way in software, which I don't know how they would. It would have to be... They would need... I mean, they could just do a utility. Yeah, it'd have to be like a utility. As long as you're okay storing it on either your local or like connected drive. But also like now they're making a lot of hardware for it. And it's not that hard to open a project. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, Patrick, I'm going to cut us off right there, dude. Again, you are welcome back anytime. This was such a fun episode. I love getting nerdy on editing. So thank you so much for coming on. I think the last thing I want to say for today is just make sure to tell the people, you know, the Jake Filzine family, if for some reason they are here and don't know who you are, where can they find you? Obviously, we need more Patrick Sterling fans in the world. So. Uh, yeah, the, the big deal is the YouTube channel. That's just Patrick Sterling. Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-A-N-G. Um, I'm probably next most active on Twitter, but that's, you know, pretty informal. Um, and then my website is sterlingsupply.co. Again, that's linked all over uh, the channel, too, because I have got dozens of free presets and templates and plugins and a few uh, paid products as well that live up there. Yep. And I have your picture in picture one, which is great. And there's a lot of other options there. Definitely go check that stuff out. Patrick's a maniac and his channel's awesome. So thank you so much again, dude, for coming on today. What a blast. And yeah, don't be a stranger. You'll be, you'll be hearing from, well, we're going to film a vlog. So you'll be hearing from me in the future. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. All right. Thanks. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Bye.